The Boeing 757 is a twin-engine, single-aisle aircraft which has revolutionized air travel as we know it today. It's a medium-range airliner and it has been used on many transatlantic routes after production ended in 2004. The plane is 80% more efficient than its predecessor, the 727, which the 757 was meant to replace, and it has a range of 3,900 nautical miles or 7,200 kilometers. However, what really makes the aircraft stand out is its capacity. At the time, medium-haul flights were operated by inefficient four-engine or trijet aircraft due to limited range from short-haul planes like the 737. The 707 could be used, but it was just too old. It carried too many passengers, and by 1982 when the 757 rolled out the factory, it was just too inefficient. The 757 has a capacity of up to 228 passengers, meaning that every seat could be filled, compared to the larger 747s where many seats would be left empty. Now at the beginning of its service, the 757 was generally used on short and mid-range domestic flights, and US transatlantic flights for example, Los Angeles to New York routes. Today most 757s fly transatlantic, however this was not possible in the 1980s. This was due to something called ETOPS. Now ETOPS essentially means that twin-engine aircraft can't really fly over oceans as a precaution in case of an engine failure. ETOPS still exist today, however some twin-engine aircraft have ETOPS ratings of 180 minutes, meaning that they can fly 3 hours away from the nearest available airport. The launch customer for the 757 was Eastern Airlines, however the primary users today are Delta and United Airlines with FedEx and UPS operating the freighter variants. Now the 757-200 was the first 757 model and it could seat up to 224 people. In 1992 after gaining ETOPS approval, multiple airlines began operating the aircraft over the ocean, beginning with Transair with a route from Tucson to Honolulu. Delta and United have both been operating flights to Europe with the aircraft from their east coast bases. United operates many 757s out in Newark to smaller European destinations, whilst their larger aircraft operate to cities like London, Paris and Frankfurt. The European routes push the aircraft to its limits of its range, and I'm sure that if the plane had an extra 500 kilometers, it would have sold even more. Production of the 757-200 came to a total of 913 aircraft, making it the most popular 757 model by far. Now the 200PF was the cargo variant of the 200, which entered service in 1987 with UPS Airlines. It was targeted at overnight delivery companies like UPS and FedEx, and it could carry up to 15 pallets on its main deck, with 51 cubic meters of space on the lower deck for bulk cargo. Since ETOPS rating doesn't really apply to non-passenger flights, the aircraft with a range of 5,830 kilometers would fly transatlantic. However, this would barely even reach Western Europe. Anything beyond Paris would be unreachable from New York. Now the next model to be created was the 200M, which was the combi variant of the 757 family. It could carry both passengers and cargo on its main deck, and it entered service with Royal Nepal Airlines in 1988. The variant appears the same as the normal passenger 757 from the outside, besides a forward portside cargo door. It can carry 2 to 4 cargo pallets on its main deck, as well as 148 passengers depending on the configuration. Most of the 757 freighters that exist today were converted from passenger aircraft. FedEx alone has 119 of them. They're called 757-200SFs, and the first conversion took place in 2001, which was sold to DHL Aviation. The main cargo deck has a capacity of 14 pallets, which is only one less than the dedicated freighter version of the 757. FedEx announced a $2.6 billion deal to secure 80 converted 757 freighters in order to replace its aging 727 fleet. Next in line is the 757-300. It's a stretched version of the 200 at a length of 54 meters. For reference, the 787-8 is 57 meters long. It's the longest single-aisle twin-engine aircraft up to date, and it was designed to serve the charter airline market and provides low-cost replacement for the larger 767-200. It has a range of 6,290 kilometers, making transatlantic routes possible. Due to the length of the plane, this variant also features a retractable tail skid at the back end of the plane 
underneath the horizontal stabilizers. Condor ordered the aircraft to replace its DC-10s and it was hoped that it would serve as a low-cost high-density aircraft carrying passengers to holiday destinations like the Canary Islands. Now the 300 has been operated by mainline carriers like Continental Airlines which is now part of United and Northwest Airlines which is part of Delta and Iceland Air. Other operators have been included are American Trans Air which was the first North American operator, Arkia Israel Airlines along with charter airlines like Condor and Thomas Cook Airlines. Production of the 300 total 55 aircraft all of which are still in service today. Now the launch customer British Airways operated the 757-200 for 27 years before retiring the type in November 2010. To celebrate the fleet's retirement, the airline unveiled one of its last three 757-200s in a retro style livery on October 4th, 2010, matching the colour scheme that they introduced on the aircraft in 1983. After that, the variant remained in operation with the company's subsidiary Open Skies. So why is the 757 aircraft so successful? Now during its life in production, the 757 filled a gap in the market, acting as a middle ground between the smaller 737 series and the larger 747s and the 767s. At the time, Airbus had no competing aircraft. It was bigger and it had a greater range than the smaller aircraft and it was smaller and cheaper to operate than a wide body. The 757 is now old. It's inefficient compared to modern aircraft but still there's no replacement. Now Boeing has tried to rush a replacement with the 737 MAX 9 but it simply falls short of the 757. The MAX 9 requires a longer runway compared to the 757 meaning it can't operate out of smaller airports. Furthermore, the engine performance of the 757 is better. It can fly straight to cruising altitude However, the 737 requires a step climb procedure where it will climb to a certain altitude, burn off fuel to reduce weight and then proceed to go higher. Although the range of the 737 MAX 9 does allow for transatlantic flights, there's concerns that during the winter months, headwinds will mean a stopover is required. United and Delta have been scratching their heads over what to replace their aging 757s with. Most domestic 757s have been replaced by the A321s and the 737-900ERs, but neither Airbus or Boeing have released a good sized replacement for longer missions across the Atlantic or to South America. Now Airbus plans to take some of the transatlantic 757 market with its A321LR and also the XLR, compared to the 3915 miles for the 757. However, multiple airlines that have looked at the A321LR says the plane will not be capable of carrying a high payload as the 757 across the Atlantic. Now while Boeing will never upgrade the 757, they most likely will incorporate many of the 787 features into a clean sheet middle of the market jet, the 797. We can expect a standard 787 cockpit alongside next generation engines, a modern cabin and a small widebody configuration. We can also expect that Boeing will heavily utilize carbon composites with their new mid-sized jet. We know that airlines want a longer range mid-sized plane that can efficiently fly around 200 people on long transcontinental and secondary international markets. Any 797 needs to be capable of the 757-like performance too. Boeing still has time to figure out the best solution and the plane isn't expected to enter service until sometime in the middle of the next decade. That's why a need for the 797 is needed more than ever, which I'll be talking about in the final episode of the Boeing Timeline series. Thank you so much for watching this episode in the Boeing History Timeline videos. Let me know what your thoughts are on the 757 in the comments below. What's your favourite livery on the 757 and would you consider it to be as successful as other aircraft? Remember to like and subscribe if you like this series and check out this video on why the 757 is so good. Remember to like and subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next timeline video.